and the people of the island had never experienced seeing a ship before and nothing as large as that had come into their lives and they could not actually physically see the entire ship because they'd never experienced that. And to my mind, uh, that's quite fascinating because it's an indication of the capacity of our mind and how our mind, through learning, through observation, through looking at things, we can expand that capacity. Now, with the hidden geometry of life, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the nature of reality and how things come into being, the process of uh, creating from uh, the process of how reality is structured and then how nature creates things and then how we mimic that creative process ourselves when we're doing something like art and how we can expand our minds. I look at it from a scientific, an artistic and also spiritual perspective because all three of those things are important. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride because I go th I take you into all sorts of different um, areas of science and I can only really give you tidbits of those with the view that maybe you'll explore them for yourselves because I can't give them obviously the amount of uh, space that they're due because it would be an enormous book. So the journey begins basically, it starts with looking at the human capacity to imagine things because through our imaginations we can start to question behind reality, behind the scene, to see, well, why does this happen? What does this mean? And why does this work in this way? And, and what does it mean to me? And uh, the first things we did were basic petroglyphs, basic geometric shapes, to represent the ideas that we were having in our heads and what we saw. And from that, all our numerical systems, all our ways of representing things through symbolism have developed. And that has allowed us to evolve into very sophisticated species. Geometry is the first language. Geometry is universal. It doesn't matter which country you go to, a square is a square. A square fundamentally does the same things. Basic shapes don't have lines. What they do is hold together energy. They act like force fields, containers and vessels. Without a circle, we wouldn't be able to think about the idea of time. How would time work? How would it be facilitated? How would we exist within time? And then, how would we represent what time looks like to other people? And we do that through the circle, through clock faces, by standing in a circle, by sharing events in time, work circles, social circles, knitting circles. We use it in our languages. Squares, I feel boxed in. Squares fix things. Whereas, whereas, whereas a circle will roll, a square will stay in one place. So geometry not only structures reality and allows us to exist within it, it also allows us to communicate <coughs> the ideas behind there and also to use them as tools. So this is why fundamentally this book is about those be some very basic shapes and how they spin this web, a matrix if you like, of different types within which we can exist. Light is the next facet. Light is the gossamer. Got light and the various shades and colours fill in those force fields. They are what give us our substance so that we can actually look out and we can see each other. Through light shining us, we are revealed. We can be seen. And we have our inner light as well that can shine out so from a spiritual point of view, so they can see us, see our souls within us. Sound, sound is the, 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 the vehicle, the vessel with which the geometric code is carried around. Because how are we to um, capture it? How is light meant to form? What is it that transferred? And that's where sound comes into it. Then we have the, or I also cover the classical elements, because they're incredible metaphors for describing the different types of conditions of being that come into creation, different states of from solidity through to more and more ethereal conditions. They also um, relate to the process of cooking ingredients, and this is where the number five and seven come into place. Because nature cooks things like bread, we have basic ingredients, fire, air, water, water and earth, things like that. We put them together, different combinations, we heat them up, and you have all sorts of different kinds of bread. So therefore we have all sorts of different kinds of being, be it a rock or a human. So I take you through this process of looking at geometry, how it structures things, how light fills it in, how sound carries a code. And then when we use those same um, a 
aspects, those same things. End, I go back to the beginning and say, well, actually, in essence, everything is really all very simple. Because the middle of all the shapes, and this is an incredible illustration that was drawn to cover, is this model I call the gateway to the heavens, which my first book was about, because the basic shapes combined. And this is just one way of illustrating everything I talk about in the book. The shapes are coloured by light, and also they have the classical elements in there. And I call this the gateway to becoming. It's all the constituent parts that are in there, these basic shapes, that have built up this incredibly complex reality that we really live in. And the middle of it, the middle of the circle is the moment, now, that very still point in the middle, which time revolves around. The middle of the square is now, uh, sorry, is here, where we are, because I'm always here. It doesn't matter where I move, I'm always here. I can never be there. I'm always here. The middle of the triangles is I am, that I am, stripping away all the levels that we put on mother, wife, British, that hide us from that true identity. And um, that indivisible I am here now, that's all we have and everything else is this illusion around us that we're participating in this journey that we have. Um, so it, it's looking at things science, from a scientific point of view, from an artistic, creative point of view, and the spirituality that is within all of those, because that is obviously important, because it brings meaning to it. And that is it in a nutshell. This is where they originated from, because the builders of old recognised that as they were constructing something, any building, you were um, doing something with reverence. It was a sacred act because you were being literally the builder. And in uh, Freemasonry, God is the architect and God is the builder is something that they recognised. Um, so when you're building something, how is it placed on the earth? In what direction? What is the materials made of? All these things are actually the, uh, the feng shui of the building. How does the light come in? How does the air come in? You are. Uh, constituent part of that. And when you are laying your bricks, are you laying them in a frustrated way, in an angry way, or are you doing it with reverence and with love? Because that will be left in the building. It will become part of the building. Your how you feel about it when you're doing it. It's quite true actually. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is the thing that people find very difficult to imagine, that the fact that if the thought, the intent behind our thoughts and our actions and deeds will become part of it. So you can go into a gallery and all these paintings are pretty incredible technically and you walk in and you're depressed. That's because the artist was probably depressed when they built it, when they were drawing them. You can walk into another one and be uplifted. You can look at a plain sheet of paper and the person when they were painting that was doing it with love and you look at it and you're moved by it. When you bake a cake or make clothes or anything that you do, you'll be imprinting something in there. And when I do my talks and go around the country, what I get people to do is very simple exercises, one of, one of which, which you can try at home, it's not enough space, is you just stand there like this, and you imagine you're holding the corners of a square, and then you may imagine that square turning into a circle. Or and the trivium. And your body changes. It's like, oh, like this. Now all you did was think about that, and yet your body reacted to it. So the power of the thought to influence your body is quite phenomenal. And it's, it's quite, it's some of the major, major skeptics who poo poo some mysticism and spirituality. When you get them to do that and you see that it actually rocks their, makes them go away and think about things, which is what you're. So I would say, how does it affect you? What, how does it influence? Think about how you are building, where you are building. The impact of what you're building is going to have on other people because it will have an influence on it. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Any other questions? No, not just my balls. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, <clears throat> are, you, are you still planning to do another book? How is, how are you gonna, what's the next dimension to go to? Well, that, it's quite funny you should say that because I spent years researching on this and I have a friend here today who was with me when I had my first yellow stickies 
full stickies, and I said, she said, oh, you must write a book about this. And I started and got absolutely obsessed. I also have my very supportive husband here, who has watched me go from a very professional, lucrative career to this manic woman um, <laughs> who thought she could do a book in one year, and now 15 years later, here I am. And I am planning a series of five. And my original book manuscript was enormous, and I had to just cut out. Because I was, it became Encyclopedia Britannica. Because part of the journey, of the thing that was so pleasurable for me was all the research that I'd going through all these doors. And I got overwhelmed with information, and I, you know, it is an exciting thing, exploring all these avenues. So my first two books basically set the framework for, this is geometry, this is light, this is how everything fits together. Okay, now let's look at how it's applied. I'm going to look at the earth and the nature of the earth and all the materials, the grids, why we built temples, why they're redundant, because we've basically forgotten how to turn them on, because we don't use our consciousness anymore to do that. We've become so fixed on here, we don't do that. And the book after that is going to be about us and the geometry within us and us as a temple in our own right. And then the next one, I've only got about three chapters on that one. But there, there will be some more after that. But I seem to keep splitting them up into two because I, I do get a bit carried away. <laughs> Another question? Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to comment that having read your first book and on my way through with the second one, it's very much to me as though you can walk through life, and to me, you're like a tracker. It's like if you're walking through a rainforest, you can walk through it completely unaware. But if you learn how to read, you can learn so much. And I think that with your book, what you're doing is you're acting as a signpost and helping people, if you like, to read life. I don't really know how else to put it. Mm -hmm. Very much like a guide. That's and very kind of you. Looking up and, and becoming aware. I and think learning. that's very much what goes back to the story right at the beginning that I said, that these people have never seen a ship. So they couldn't, their mind 